Howdy folks, welcome to Found Flicks. On this Ending Explain, we'll be looking at one that I've gotten consistent requests for since I started the channel, The Chernobyl Diaries, where a group of tourist kids visit the abandoned nuclear site, but soon discover they might not be alone after all. Admittedly, I like the setup of the movie, and Chernobyl is a great backdrop to unleash terror, as it looks pretty creepy all by itself. But the movie falls apart into a series of the same basic scenario happening. People go look for something and eventually get scared running back to the others. This happens over and over again, and it's disappointing that they didn't try to do more with the strong concept they had to work with. It's also weird from a stylistic perspective, as from what I remember the movie was found footage, and while it does utilize that janky camera style, it technically is only pretending to be found footage, as none of the characters are actually filming at any point. It's just that they decided to use that style, probably for budgetary reasons, but it's just the camera's perspective as in any normal movie. I'm like, wait, who's filming this scene. All right, no one. This is a bizarre choice as I'm not sure of any other movies that pretend to be found footage and really kept taking me out of the movie. They could have easily added a typical camera toting character and this would have made a lot more sense. Oh, that's Charlie or whatever. He sure loves filming with his video camera. Done. Or, you know, alternatively, just shot it like a regular movie. Just kind of bugged me for whatever reason. Anyway, there is some question as to what the group encounters and what happens in the end. So let's take an extreme tour of a nuclear disaster in the Chernobyl Diaries, breaking down the story, what the creatures are and how they came to be, and explaining the ending as well as the alternate ending that helps us understand things a bit more. We open with our faux video diary footage, meeting our group of free-spirited tourists hamming it up at the airport and all around London. And in case it's not clear just how free-spirited they are, the whole thing is set to Supergrass's tune, All Right. You know, since they can't establish characters for themselves, let the song do it for them. And that's about as far as what we learn about these pals. They're pretty much interchangeable cardboard cutouts. Yeah, there's a couple of girls, a blonde one, a brunette one, that one dates that one. It doesn't matter. The real purpose of their journey is to seek out Chris's brother who moved to Kiev and hasn't been in contact much since. Turns out he's fine and is just loving the Kiev life so much, including more honeys than he can possibly handle apparently. And Chris has big news too, intending to propose to his girlfriend Natalie in the most romantic city in the world, Moscow. Ah uh, yes, the city of lights they call it. The next morning at breakfast, Paul shows up with a crazy new plan for the group that will destroy their lives forever. The opportunity to tour the infamous Chernobyl site, thanks to a tip from a guy called Yuri who runs extreme tourist trips, taking them in a van to the remnants of the location. Well, that all sounds very reputable, yet at first the others are less than enthused with changing their original plans and over safety concerns about the radiation. But Paul convinces them it's safe. And after a bit more nonsense about it being the opportunity of a lifetime, they vote to go, except for Chris, who grumbles about his brother taking over as usual. Even though Yuri's extremely hodgepodge and unprofessional looking shop doesn't instill much confidence, Yuri himself at least seems to know what's up. He's former special ops and assures the group that this isn't his first rodeo and has done the same tour incident free for years. Well, after some hesitation, I do trust the guy that he knows what he's doing. Just as long as he's around, I think they might be okay. And they're joined too by a hippie couple that stumbles in, Zoe and Michael, other fellow extreme tour enthusiasts who have been dating for an entire month. True love, I'm sure. Or more like it's someone else I can travel around Europe for cheap with and can stomach my smell from never showering. Yuri's van is unsurprisingly less than luxurious, but come on, it's Yuri. He's got this thing. You run a tight ship, Yuri. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Turns out the brute has a more philosophical side too, filling them in on the details of the incident and describing it as nature reclaiming its rightful home. Damn, that's deep, dude. At the edge of the town Pipiot that surrounds Chernobyl, which makes up the exclusion zone, they're surprised to see a live outpost with military guards waiting, who refuse to let them pass as there's maintenance being done in the area. Both things strike them as odd. If the area is truly abandoned, why would these guards be here? And what kind of maintenance will be going on? Perhaps it's not as abandoned as they were led to believe. But this development doesn't stop them from wanting to still keep going. Going. Paul angrily asserting that they already paid for the tour. Look, you're gonna break the law if you have to. I paid 40 bucks for this thing. And Yuri obliges, traversing through back trails in the forest and easily coasts into the forbidden zone undetected. And no one really seems bothered by any of this, just stoked to get inside, even with all the radiation labels and signs covering the area. There is reason to be worried about the radiation too, as seen when Yuri pulls over at a lake to pull a prank on the kids, pretending to be attacked by something in the water, only to uncover on the shore 
or a giant freakish mutated fish with giant fangs that's still alive. And see, the lake is full of them, all darting around in the murky water. Hmm, well, looks like there's enough radiation to do some serious mutation around these parts. Who cares? On with the tour. They make it to the city limits, nestled amongst the giant looming buildings that house the workers and families of the plant, all abandoned for decades and unquestionably pretty creepy. In particular, that they had so little time to vacate that their scorched belongings and photos are even still left behind. Here again, proving Yuri to be the most complex character of the film, which means at all. Tearing up at the sight of the aftermath in the apartment and lamenting about a fair day that never happened in front of a decayed Ferris wheel. This guy has real emotions and is actually a complex character as he has real ties to the events that happened here. Unlike these kids, you know, our main characters, who are a bunch of empty-headed morons just looking to have an extreme time. Night setting in, Yuri tells the kids it's time to go until a strange rustling sound stops them in their tracks, which oddly turns out to be a big old bear that storms down the hallways. But not a mutant bear or anything, unfortunately, from what I can tell. Though it seems they're not alone besides the random bear. Coming back to the van and finding it unable to start, discovering that it has been sabotaged. But who or what could have done that? Especially since they're supposed to be alone. And even Yuri is like, yeah, there's definitely no one else here. I keep telling you kids, only to pull out a gun from the glove box. Oh, we're real safe, are we? As the checkpoint where they entered is about 15 miles away, he tells them their best plan is to stay in the van until morning and try to fix it then. But he's not planning on hanging around, abandoning the kids, and deciding to go investigate outside after hearing more odd noises. This sounding like the cries of a baby. Chris decides to tag along, getting in another dig at his brother about this all being his fault before the two disappear into the night. The others peering out, unable to see anything until a gunshot rings out and Paul brazenly runs out after it, emerging moments later carrying a wounded and frantic Chris, his leg appearing to be gnawed on and gored, and repeating that Yuri is gone, taken by them, that there is a whole group of them. Uh-oh, sounds like there are other people out there, or perhaps not exactly people considering what they did to his leg, which looks pretty messed up. Things only get more dire as a gang of stray dogs attack the van, which could have been what attacked Chris and Yuri, and soon after the van's battery dies, leaving them cold and in the dark. The next morning, Paul steps up with a new, utterly pointless plan, promising his injured brother he's going to get him out of here, joined by Beardy and Amanda to search for the missing Yuri. Because yeah, I'm sure he's totally alive. But these goofs still don't have a clue about what's really going on, still blaming the attack on the dogs. Yet when finding Yuri's walkie and following a serious blood trail into a building, they discover Yuri's mutilated corpse and get our first encounter with the creatures that inhabit the area. As one enters into the room, the others scatter and hide as it proceeds to feed on Yuri's corpse. Amanda catches its attention when trying to escape, but they at least are able to retrieve Yuri's gun. Even though they don't get a good look at whatever it is, they are aware enough that they need to get the hell out of here now. But Chris can't even stand on his injured leg, especially for 15 miles, forcing him to stay behind along with Natalie. But Paul at least leaves them with the other walkie and the gun, again promising to get them help. Yes, I have 100% faith in him, especially as they don't have a map and have no idea where they're going, uselessly wandering around never knowing if they're actually getting any closer to the outpost. Though, they do have the good fortune of finding parts at a junkyard to fix the van. They are also finding the remaining evidence of a guard being attacked by something in a school bus, and it looks like he lost seeing a torn piece of his bloody uniform. They return to where the van had been parked, seeing only some debris left behind, and finding it overturned several feet away, the back ripped open and blood covering the windows. Oh, well that doesn't look good. And huzzah! The movie, if for only a moment, actually becomes found footage, retrieving a phone on the ground amongst the wreckage, playing back a recording of what happened. First, Chris, looking pretty close to death's door, starts to propose to Natalie, but she naively responds to wait, still somehow believing they'll get out of their situation, made instantly futile when loud pounds are heard outside, shattering the windows and flipping the van, seeing Natalie dragged off by a creature and the phone drops to the ground. Well, so much for that proposal and for Paul fulfilling his promises of getting help and proving himself a good brother, because chances are he's been horribly and violently murdered by mutants. They refuse to give up hope though on the missing two, searching in a dark as shit building for him, searching for several minutes of screen time, yet finding nothing for quite some time. 
then a creature appears out of nowhere from behind something nearby. Hey guys! Scaring the group out of the room in their mad scramble finding a map. Convenient! And a shell-shocked Natalie, who won't say what happened to Chris. Clearly horrified by the gruesome fate that befell him, Amanda helps Paul get his shit together to continue until a small child appears in front of them. Paul tries to communicate with them in Russian to no response, and not noticing as Natalie, sitting at the top of the stairs behind them, is quickly snatched away by another creature. Oh, whoops, sorry Natalie, didn't even think that could happen. They do try to track her down from her screams, but come across a horde of the creatures, emerging from the shadows all around them, forcing them back into a building. Jeez, that's all these guys do is run around like buffoons, though they are able to get to safety for the moment. And I guess Michael was left behind, I, I didn't even notice, because Zoe is freaking out. So goodbye to that guy, Michael. Let's take a moment to remember everything we knew about him. He had a beard, he was Australian, and most importantly, loved extreme tourism. Okay, moving on. The remaining group continue deeper into the facility, entering into increasingly narrow tunnels, coming to what looks like a makeshift experiment room, with gurneys and stuff all spread around. The halls getting even tinier, they quicken their pace, hearing the horde at their heels, finding another room which Paul somehow determines is where these creatures must be living. Pretty sweet digs for a mutant, I must say. You got your, uh, there's almost nothing in the room. It's terrible. He approaches a body, thinking it might be his brother, but nope, it's another mutant guy, who, while they try to ascend a ladder, is joined by several others of his pals. And poor Zoe is pulled down right as they're about to get out. Ooh, so close. The duo find themselves in a highly radioactive area, their Geiger counter going off the charts, and assumedly are quite close to the towers themselves where it would be the most dangerous. And it doesn't take long for the radiation to have severe effects on them physically, since their faces start melting and shit. Running outside, they are greeted by blinding lights that pierce the darkness. It's the Russian military, and I'm sure they're here to help out. I mean, they're clearly unarmed and all messed up asking for help over and over. Certainly they will help them out, right? <laughs> oh, guess not. But instead of shooting Amanda, a soldier approaches, placing a bag over her head, coming to in the back of an ambulance where we hear that the people are referred to as patients and victims of radiation. Amanda later wakes up on a gurney in a strange hospital, several doctors looming over her. Realizing she's seen too much, they decide they can't let her go and toss her into a prison cell. She doesn't feel alone though, calling out to someone else in there with her. Guess who? A whole bunch of mutants that descend upon her. And that's the end of the line for Amanda. Even though this outcome doesn't make much sense. If they were going to kill her, why not just shoot her like they did Paul? Or maybe it was just feeding time. In case it's not 100% clear, this hospital is responsible for experiments utilizing the still very radioactive Chernobyl site, and the results are the hideous creatures that the kids encounter there. That explains why there's still a military presence there even though the cover story is the place is abandoned, and the so-called maintenance is that their mutant patients have escaped to the town of Pipiot, which it doesn't really seem like they're doing a great job at containing. The alternate, and I would assume original ending, makes this transition from human to fleshy mutant even more clear. Things go down the same as the theatrical ending until Amanda is taken. This time we see her in a hospital bed, convulsing and writhing, revealing that her appearance now resembles that of all the other creatures. And all she did was spend a few minutes near the reactor. So it's really that simple. Exposure to high radiation creates these hideous killer mutant freaks. Though that makes me begin to question the reason for these experiments. So these supposed doctors just throw some people in there and see what happens? Yep, turned into a monster thing. Good work, everybody. Let's do it again. Um, okay? Maybe they're trying to create mutant soldiers or something? I guess that makes sense, and sounds like something the Russian government would be into. Joking. It's a joke. I did wonder if the mutants had been victims of the original incident, but I'd say those seen were all created by the hospital, and couldn't have been victims of the initial incident, who are referred to as escape patients of the hospital, indicating them to be their test subjects. Though I have no idea why they would have escaped in the first place, maybe don't put all of them in the same room? And there's that little random girl who is far too young to have been alive during the 80s. What was the deal with her anyway? I guess she was a mutant? What was up with that? It's more like a random ghost kid encounter or something something, but whatever. Point being, there's a lot that doesn't make a lot of sense. All we can say with absolute certainty is that the mutants were once human and created by the Russian military, and those poor helpless kids just looking for an extreme time got an experience a little more extreme than they bargained for. With that, we've reached the conclusion of this inning explain on the Chernobyl Diaries. Hope all of you guys that requested it are happy to see this one. And don't forget you can send me a request of any kind on my social media accounts at Foundflix. What do you guys think of the Chernobyl Diaries and its ending? Why do you think they created the mutants? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.